grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome to this online service of worship at First Presbyterian Church in High Point, North Carolina. My name is Erin Bowers and I am the associate pastor here. We want you to know how glad we are that you have chosen to worship with us today through this video format. We also want you to know that in addition to this service of worship, we are also gathering each Sunday morning on our front lawn at 9.30 a.m., weather permitting, for an in-person service of worship, and we'd be delighted for you to join us there as well. If you'd like to do that, guidelines for attending that service are available on our church website. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come, let us worship God. Let us call ourselves to worship. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Let the people of God rejoice in their Creator. Let God's people sing songs and hymns. Old and new, let them praise the Lord with voices and instruments. The Lord delights in them. Let all the saints dance for joy. Let them cry out with gladness where they rest. Let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O oh, gentle God, you shepherd us in times of trouble. When the way seems dark, you guide us safely through. When we cannot bear to slow down, you show us the wisdom of Sabbath rest. In your presence, there is life, overflowing, abundant, and free. As we rest in your goodness, teach us, O oh Lord, to see with your heart. Open our eyes to the world beyond our neighborhoods and to your beloved children, both near to us and far. Open our hearts to the blessed fierceness of your creation, which sustains us and yet is more powerful than we can imagine. Anoint us with your spirit of blessing that we might be as Christ to one another in our welcome, our compassion, and our care. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Jesus. 
We read in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So trusting in this promise of God in Scripture, let us confess our sins with our printed prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, you search our hearts and see the places where they are hardened and resistant to your will. It is easy for us to turn away from those in need, seeking our own security instead of the well-being of all creation. We allow self-interest to overwhelm your commandment to love our neighbors. It is much more difficult to put the interests of others before our own. Forgive us, we pray, and in your mercy redirect us so that we can once again walk in your ways. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. My friends, the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Believe the good news that in Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. Praise be to God. Our scripture reading today comes from Romans chapter 13, beginning with the eighth verse. Listen for the word of God. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may or may not know much about Augustine of Hippo, also referred to as St. Augustine or St. Augustine, however you want to pronounce it. He was one of the early theologians of the church, a pretty foundational theologian for what much of the Christian church believes today. He lived in the fourth century and is famous for works like The City of God and for his personal spiritual autobiography, which we often simply call The Confessions. I bring up Augustine today and particularly his confessions because a few verses from our passage from Romans that we read this morning turned out to be life-changing for Augustine. Augustine's confessions tells the story of someone who ran from God for many years even though God relentlessly pursued him. After a period of agonizing struggle, Augustine found himself alone in a garden. 
While alone, he heard the voice of children saying in a sing-songy way, pick it up, read it, pick it up, read it. Now, I have to admit that sounds a little creepy to me, but Augustine, living in the fourth century, hadn't seen movies like The Shining, so maybe it sounded a little sweeter to his ears. And so he did just that. This voice drove him to scripture. And when he opened up the Bible, he read the last two verses that we read today, Romans 13, 13 and 14. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This was probably the single most transformational moment in Augustine's life. And as he tells the story of his own conversion, he also relates the story of Anthony the Great's conversion, another early church theologian, explaining how Anthony had read in the Gospel of Matthew Go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And that Anthony was moved by this teaching, and it changed his life forever. Which just goes to show that scripture can be a real kick in the pants if we actually read it and take it to heart. It can wake us up out of a fog, shake us up, transform our lives forever. I mean, if we want to be transformed. When Augustine read those two verses, he committed himself to the life of faith such that he abandoned any plans to marry and took on the celibate life, which is not what I am suggesting for us. But I think if we take a look at the whole of the passage that we read today, there may be some things for us to consider. Paul begins in the text we read today by talking about love of neighbor and how that fulfills the law. We remember that Jesus has said the same thing, but Jesus includes the love of God as well. Jesus says that the love of God and the love of neighbor sums up all of the law. Paul knows this teaching, but emphasizes love of neighbor here. My sense is that love of neighbor is most important for Paul because Paul has just spent the entire book of Romans explaining how we cannot do anything to earn God's love. But then I think here towards the end of the book, he wants to make sure his readers understand that this doesn't mean that they are off the hook regarding the second table of the law. It is God's love that ought to drive us to love our neighbor. And then he seems to say all of this with a sense of urgency. Wake up, he says. It's daytime. Get dressed. That is, put on Christ. Salvation is near. Paul uses this image of daytime approaching, meaning that it is time to wake up. For those who lived in the first century, a time when there were no electric lights, wasting daylight was nothing to laugh at. If daytime was approaching, it was time to get up. Those were the only hours you had for working. No more laying around, no more sleepwalking through your day, no more groggy mornings before coffee. Wake up, Paul says. Now, you and I both know what it is to feel groggy, that feeling when you are not quite awake, that feeling after you haven't had a good night's sleep, when you've been restless all night and now you want to rest during the day. 
We know what it is to walk around in a haze, unable to focus on much except for what's in front of you. Honestly, I imagine many of us feel like that most of the time right now. Some of us may feel like we are in a fog because we are depressed. During this pandemic, instances of depression are on the rise. All the more reason for the urgency of loving our neighbor. Some of us may not be exactly depressed, but we may be finding ourselves struggling to think as clearly as we once did. I read an article this week that described this situation perfectly, how back in the spring when this all began, many of us were using what was referred to as our surge capacity to handle all that was being thrown at us, using mental and physical adaptive abilities to deal in a crisis, to multitask, and even to be energized by taking on more than usual. And that surge capacity has now been exhausted because it just isn't sustainable long term. So now we find ourselves not functioning particularly well mentally or physically. Our brains and our bodies are moving slower than normal. It's difficult to focus and we can feel like we are trying to work our way through a cloud. Now we have to figure out how to renew our surge capacity or some version of it. One therapist quoted in the article reports, it's harder for high achievers, which I think would include many of us. The more accustomed you are to solving problems, to getting things done, to having a routine, the harder it will be on you because none of that is possible right now. You get feelings of hopelessness and helplessness and those aren't good. Americans in particular are problem solving people. We are fixers. And so we struggle to deal with this situation, which includes grief over a variety of invisible losses. These are sometimes called ambiguous losses, losses in our lives that don't have an obvious resolution or losses that are hard to precisely define. And so we stumble around. What are we to do? Paul tells us to wake up. But that may seem easier said than done right now. We might prefer Paul take it easy on us. However, this same article on our loss of surge capacity also offers a few solutions towards renewing our energy. Among the solutions offered are, first of all, using both and thinking, which is helpful but hard to do. What that means is holding two very different thoughts together at the same time. For example, this remote learning is a disaster for my life, but it is also wonderful to be at home with my children and not to miss so much of these days of their young lives. To be able to maintain these contradictory thoughts as both true at the same time is a good coping strategy. And second, to look for activities that fulfill you rather than ones that contribute to the sense of malaise. which is good news because this means that there is a sort of selfish benefit that goes along with Paul's urgency of living the life of faith and loving our neighbor. 
See, one of the things that I'm afraid you and I might be sleepwalking through right now is the actual practice of our Christian faith. And here is where I could have titled this sermon a sermon for myself. I think that many of us, and definitely I am, walking around in a haze of ministry because we have gotten stuck on just one question. Because remember, we are problem solvers. And so it is, we focus all of our time and attention on the question that seems most pressing. Where are we worshiping and when? When will we open the building? How long will we worship outside? This one question occupies our minds. And of course it has to be addressed. But I am beginning to feel like there is an inordinate amount of energy spent on this. I know for my own part, there was a period of time when I literally thought about nothing else other than this. And it doesn't help that everyone has an opinion, which is what makes me suspect it is what so many of us are thinking about. And the more I think about this one problem, the less alert I am, the less awake I am to all the work that Jesus has given us to do as the practice of our faith. Now, let me repeat again. Of course, we need to make some decisions about where we worship and when. But we also have faithful people working on that, a small task group and a session. So in the meantime, that one question cannot be all we are about as a church. That cannot be the entire extent of our ministry, making that one decision. Because you and I don't need to be in any one particular place to participate in God's work in the world. Paul tells us we've got to wake up and put on Christ. We cannot wait until things are back to normal to act like Christians. We have to be Christians, not just when things are normal, but when they are abnormal too. There's no time to wait. Salvation is nearer now than it was when we first believed, says Paul. We have to be Christians in all circumstances. And so I am very thankful for the ways that I have seen our church at work in these unusual times, for the ways you all are using your creativity to find ways to continue to love God and neighbor, even when things aren't the same, for the great success of our food collection and school supply drive throughs For the ways that our children and youth are engaging online with their leaders. I'm thinking especially of the great success of the creation kits this summer. For those of you who simply weren't tech savvy before this time, but are figuring it out so that you can be part of meetings or part of small groups with others. I'm thankful for those of you who have found ways to meet outside with groups. I'm thankful for those of you who are faithfully caring for one another with cards and phone calls and dropping off food and other treats for one another. It's good to see God's work in the world continue with creativity. Paul encourages the people of Rome to whom he writes that there is an urgency to the faith because he says salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. And he says the same words to us. Salvation is near. My sense is that when Paul uses that phrase, it is loaded with meaning. 
and a whole other sermon could be preached on that. Suffice it to say that when Paul says salvation is near, he understood that God's kingdom is always something that is not here yet, but it is also always something that is at hand. That he wanted the Romans to live already like kingdom people as they awaited the inbreaking of the kingdom. And so we too ought to consider the urgency of living like this is the case. Maybe you've seen the bumper stickers, Jesus is coming, look busy. It's worth thinking about for a minute. Were Jesus to come back today, would we like him to find us spending all of our time puzzling over when and where we will worship? Or would we like to be found so busy participating in the mission he's given us to love and serve our neighbor? I get that we are tired. Believe me, I am tired of all of this. And it is hard to live with the ambiguity. It is hard not to feel like we are in a daze, sleepwalking our way through life. It is hard to deal with restless nights. It is hard not to put our Christianity on the shelf for a year, just as we have so many other things waiting for normalcy to return. But my sense is, not only is it our calling to love our neighbor, and so we should, but also that it will help us if we do. To do what Paul is asking us to do, waking up and putting on Christ with this kind of urgency, probably means taking off some other things. We cannot do everything at once. To do what we are called to do probably means saying no to some other things. But that may well work out for our good. If we are busy serving our neighbor, we may not have as much time to worry and fret about things that are out of our control. And that may serve us well. Finally, let's return to St. Augustine who has some closing words for us. Looking again to his confessions, one of his most famous quotes, which is really a prayer, goes like this. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. When we are fulfilling the purpose for which God has made us, we won't be restless. And maybe then we won't find ourselves sleepwalking through our days, looking for clarity. We don't have to guess what that purpose is. It is simply to love our neighbor. And then, when you and I have lived a full wide awake day, we can rest well at night. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? A loving God, we come to you in gratitude for your love, which is always present to us. In the stillness of this moment, we remember with thanksgiving the times in our lives when your love has enabled us to rise to our better selves. 
We thank you for the gift of your Son who came that we might know what perfect love looks like. We also remember the times when we have acted in anger rather than in love. We recall with remorse when our patience has been less than perfect and our behavior has been childish. Forgive us for the occasions when we have loved things and used people and when we have failed to make love a priority in our lives. Breathe in us new life, instilling us with enthusiasm for the opportunities we have to begin again. Empowered by your love for us, O God, let us unite ourselves with all of life in the example of Jesus, the Lord of our lives. Help us to be intentional in the way we interact with one another so that there can be no doubt as to whom we serve. And now we pause for a moment to remember those in our community and in our families who are in special need of your healing touch. Those we now name before you in the silence of our hearts. Grant comfort and healing to all who are hurting this day. And may you show us how we can share the loving presence of Christ to all in need. We pray all of this in and through the name of Jesus, praying as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We read in Malachi the following, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. In this passage, God is challenging His followers to bring the fruit of their labor to the house of the Lord and test God to see if God will not provide everything they need. Well, God is a good God who provides for our needs in ways beyond our expectations. And in response, we honor God with our giving, which becomes a statement of our trust in God to provide for us. I encourage you to continue your faithful giving to the work of God through the ministry of this church. And you may do this through our online giving links on our church's website or by mailing in your gifts to our church office. On behalf of your brothers and sisters in Christ, let me say thank you for partnering with us in ministry. May God continue to guide us and bless us. And now let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.